어, 영어 원서 읽기 500번 읽기 어제는 이제 버니큘라 챕터 1까지 읽었습니다. 와우 챕터 9까지 있는데 읽고 500번을 읽어야 합니다. 1년 넘게 걸리겠죠. 1년 넘게 안 걸리게 하려면 어, 짬나는 대로 읽어서 음, 500번을 채워야 합니다. 어, 엄청 무모한 도전 같기도 하고 음, 걱정도 되는데 걱정하는 것보다는 행동하는 게더 좋은 것 같아서 한번 해보겠습니다. 어, 오늘 이거 하기 전에 슈퍼밴드라고 하는 TV 프로그램을 잠시 봤는데 어, 어쩜 그렇게 다들 연주도 잘하고 노래도 잘하고 생기기도 잘생겼고 다들 이렇게 어, 매력들이 넘치는지 모르겠습니다. 그거 보면서 느끼는 게 그분들이 어, 좋아하는 분야에서 엄청나게 열심히 많이 그리고 좋아하니까 건성으로 하지 않고 푹 빠져들어서 살고 있다는 느낌을 받았어요. 그분들이 야 역시 뭔가에 빠져서 열심히 사는 사람들은 뭔가를 해내고 또그 모습들이 주변의 평가를 아직까지는 받지 못하고 있더라도 어, 참 멋있다 어, 그리고 그렇기 때문에 꼭 뭔가 해낼 거다 라는 이런 생각이 들더라고요 그래서 어, 참 괜찮았던 것 같습니다 어, 노래들도 너무 좋고 예. 어, 낭독 끝나고 나면 콜드플레이의 에버글로우 한번 푹 빠져 보려고 합니다 아, 노래 너무 좋았습니다 어, 여러분들도 한번 들어 보시기 바랍니다 자 이제 오늘은 브라니큘라 챕터 2 부터 읽어서 끝내 보려고 하는데요 어 오늘은 그 우리가 이제 섀도우 리딩 이라고 그러죠 어, 섀도우 리딩 식으로 한번 읽어 보려고 해요 어, 원음을 들으면서 책을 보고 바로 따라 읽을 겁니다 바로 따라 읽는데 어, WPM이 맞춰지지 않으면 이게 놓치는 경우가 되게 많아요 그래서 어, 어떻게 될지 저도 잘 모르겠는데 음, 한번 섀도우 리딩 방식으로 한번 읽어 보도록 하겠습니다 어, Chapter 2, b u n n y c l a Music in the Night I feel at this time there are a few things you should know about Chester. He's not your ordinary cat. But then, I'm not your ordinary dog since an ordinary dog wouldn't be writing this book, would he? Chester came into the house several years ago as a birthday gift for Mr. Monroe, along with the two volumes of G.K. Chester, hence the name Chester, and the first edition of Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. As a result of this introduction to literature, and given the fact that Mr. Monroe is an English professor, Chester developed a taste for reading early in life. I, on the other hand, have developed a taste for books. I found the Jonathan Livingston Seagull particularly delicious. From Chester's kid, kittenhood on, Mr. Mullen has used him as a sounding board for all his student lectures. If Chester doesn't fall asleep when Mr. Mullen is talking, the lecture can be counted a success. Every night when the family is sleeping, Chester goes to the bookshelf, selects his midnight reading, and curls up on his favorite chair. He especially likes mystery stories and the tales of horror. and the supernatural as a result, he has developed a very vivid imagination. I'm telling you this because I think it's important for you to know something of Chester's background before I relate to you the story of the events following the arrival of a vernacular into our home. Let me begin with that first night. It seems that after I went to sleep, Chester still is stewing over the lost milk. Settled down with his latest book and attempted to ignore the numbering in his stomach. The room was dark and quiet. This, this did not prevent his reading, of course. Since, as you know, cats can see in the dark, a shaft of moonlight fell across the rabbit's cage and spilled onto the floor below. The wind and the rain had stopped and the chatter, chatter led Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher. He became increasingly aware of the eerie stillness that had taken their place. As Chester tells it, 
I suddenly felt compelled to look at the rabbit. I don't know what came over me, he said to me the next morning, but a cold chill ran down my spine. The little bunny had begun to move for the first time since he had been put in his cage. He lifted his tiny nose and inhaled deeply, as if gathering substances from the moonlight. He slicked his ears back close to his body, and for the first time, Chester said, I noticed a peculiar marking on his forehead. What had seemed an ordinary black spot between his ears to a constrained V-shape, which connected with the big black patch that covered his back and each side of his neck. It looked as if he was wearing a coat, and no more. No, more like a cape than a coat. Through the silence, it had drifted strains of uh, remote and exotic music. I could have sworn it was a gypsum violin. Chester told me, I thought perhaps a caravan was passing, passing by, so I ran to the window. I remembered my mother telling me something about the caravans when I was a puppy, but for the life of me, I couldn't remember what. What caravan? I asked, feeling a little stupid. A caravan is a band of, of gypsies traveling through the forest in their wagons, Chester answered. Ah, yes. It was coming back to me now. Staggered wagons? No, covered wagons. The gypsies travel all through the land, setting up camps around the great bonfires, and doing magical tricks. And sometimes, if you cross their palms with a piece of silver, they will tell your fortune. You mean if I gave them a fork, they'd tell my fortune? I asked briefly, breathlessly. Chester looked at me with a disdain. Save your silverware, he said. It wasn't a caravan after all. I was disappointed. What was it? I asked. Chester explained that when he looked out the window, he saw Professor Micklewhite, our next-door neighbor, playing the violin in his living room. He listened for a few moments to the haunting melody and sighed with a relief. I really got to stop reading those horror stories late at night, he thought. It's beginning to affect my mind. He yawned and turned to go back to his chair and he got some sleep. As he turned, however, he was startled, startled by what he saw there in the moonlight as the music filtered through the air, said the bunny, his eyes intense and staring an unearthly aura about them. Now this is the part of you won't believe, Chester said to me, but as I watched, his lips parted in a hideous smile and wear a rabbit buck, buck teeth that should, should have been two little pointed fangs. Glistened. I wasn't sure what to make of Chester's story, but the way he told it, it set my hair on end. Chapter 3 Some Unusual Goings On The next few days passed uneventfully. I was very bold. Our new arrival slept all day, and the Chester, whose curiosity had been aroused by the strange behavior of the rabbit that first my night, had decided to stay awake every night to observe him. Therefore, he too spent most of his days sleeping, so I had no one to talk to. The evenings weren't much better. Toby and Pete, who used to play with me as soon as they got home from school, now ran immediately to their to the silly rabbit's cage to play with him, or at least they'd try to. Vernicula did not make the most energetic playmate. It took him quite a while to wake up each night, and then, when he did awaken, he didn't do much except to hop around the living room. He didn't play catch, he didn't patch, he didn't roll over to get his tummy rubbed. I couldn't understand why they played with him at all. I expect it was because he was new and different, but I was confident that they would soon tire of him and come back to trust the old Harold. Finally, on the morning of the fourth day, I caught Chester blurry eyed over the water dish. He glamoured at me in a most unpleasant manner. You know, Chester, you were never exactly charming in the morning, but lately you've been become downright grumpy. grumpy. Chester growled in a re response. What are you doing this for anyway? What are you looking for? He's just a cute little bunny. Cute little bunny. Chester was amazed at my character analysis. That's what you think. He's a danger to this household and everyone in it. Oh, Chester, I said with an indulgent smile. I think your reading has gone to uh, your head. It's just because I do read that I know what I'm talking about. Well, what are you talking about? I still don't understand. I'm not sure yet, 
but I know there's something funny about that rabbit. That's why I have to keep it alert. But look at you. You're exhausted. You sleep all the time. How can you call that alert? I'm awake when it's important. He sleeps all day, so I sleep all day. So just what have you seen since the first night that makes you uneasy? Well, said Chester, I, um, that is, at this point, Chester started to base his tail, which is Cat's way of changing a subject that he finds uncomfortable. He then stumbled sleepily into the living room. So, I asked again, following him, What have you seen? Nothing, he snapped, and proceeded to curl up on his chair to go to sleep. After a moment, he, op he opened one eye. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to see. For the next few mornings, it was the same routine. I'd be ready for a good rub, romp around the living room, and the chatter would go to sleep. Peter and Toby were at school. Mr. Morneau was at the university. He never did too much romping around, anyway. And Mrs. Morneau was at her office. No one to play with a poor, neglected Harold. At first, I thought I could strike up a friendship with a bunicula and maybe teach him a few tricks, but I could never wake him up. He was always waking up just about the sunset when I wanted to take a snooze. A rabbit, I concluded. It's a cute to look at, but it's generally useless, especially as a companion to dogs. So I would retire each day with my favorite shoe to the rug and chew. Now, some people, especially Mr. and Mrs. Marnone, can't understand my taste for shoes and they yell at me for snacking on, the, on them. But I always say there's no accounting for taste. For instance, I remember one evening when Mr. Murnau picked some of his soul boards out of the bowl by his chair and dropped a green, green one on the floor. He didn't notice it as it rolled across the room and landed near my nose. I decided this is a perfect opportunity to try one for myself. I placed it in my mouth and wished immediately that I had it. As the tears started running out of my eyes, I thought, what's wrong with my mouth? It's turning inside out. Mr. Murnau immediately noticed that something had happened. What's the matter, Harold? Are you looking for someone to kiss? Help? Help! I wanted to cry, but all that came out was an ooh sound. I ooed for days. So how can anyone who likes green soul balls criticize me for preferring, preferring a nice panty roper or a bedroom slipper? But back to the matter at hand. One morning, Chester had news. That bunny, he whispered to me across our food boards, got out of his cage last night. Don't be ridiculous, I said. How could he break through the wire? Look how little he is. That's just it. He didn't break through any wire. He got out of his cage without breaking anything or opening any doors. I looked puzzled. So Chester told me the following story. Now, Harold, he said. I don't want you thinking I'm not a good, good watch cat, but after a few hours last night, I grew curious about the time. I went into the hallway, and you know that new clock they've got, the big one that goes all the way to the ceiling. Well, see, it has the thing in the middle called the pendulum. At first, I figured I would just leave it alone. It looked like that spool they tied on a string and hung from a dirt dog for me to play with them when I was a kitten. Every time I hit the silly spool with my paw, it would swing back and hit me on the nose. I hated that toy, so naturally when I saw this one, I decided not to have anything to do with it. I checked the time. It was midnight. I was all set to go back to the living room when something stopped me. Curiosity? I ventured. I suppose you could call it that. I preferred to think of it as the challenge of the unknown. I put one paw over my nose and reached out with the other one and gave it one good snap. I, I darn near broke my arm. It is just still tender to see how swollen it is. He showed me his little paw. I couldn't see anything wrong, but I knew better than to argue with him. Oh yeah, I said. That looks terrible. You must, you must be suffering awfully. You'd better go easy today. He limped uh, dramatically, just proud enough to display his new handicap and continued. I couldn't even get to the pendulum. Somebody had put glass in front of it, and I was pretty mad. 
I was all set to go back. But at the same time, I couldn't help watching the thing move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It was so easy to watch. And before I knew what had happened, I was waking up. You fell asleep? I asked incredulous, incredulously. I couldn't only hit, I couldn't help it. I didn't even know it had happened, but I looked up at the face of the clock and it was 12.45. I'd been gone in 45 minutes. I ran back into the living room, looked at the Bonicola's cage, and it was empty. I couldn't imagine where he was. Then I noticed a light coming from under the kitchen door. I went into the crouch, stalking the light when, click, I heard the refrigerator door close and the light went out. It must have been Mr. Murnau having his night, night, uh, midnight snack, I suggested. No, that's what I thought. I jumped on my chair, called the real kit and kept one eye open, pretended to be asleep. Slowly the door to the kitchen squeaked squeak open. The little head poked up from around the corner and I looked to either side to see if the coast was clear. Then, guess who came bouncing out all by myself and with that idiotic grin of his plastered all over his face. Well, I guess it wasn't Mr. Monroe, I said. Not unless he will the bunny pajamas and they get very tiny and light. Bunny killer, huh? You got it. Unfortunately, I hadn't positioned myself so that I could see him get back into the cage, and I didn't want to let him know what I had had seen anything. So I had to stay put. I still don't know how has he, he got out and or back in. At this point, Mr. Monroe came downstairs to make a breakfast. I wondered if Chester hadn't dreamed the whole thing. He didn't admit he had fallen asleep, and as I had said, he has. Quite an imagination, but I was game. After all, there hadn't been any ex excitement in this place for days. Chester and I, not our, our position, took our positions under the kitchen table. We didn't have long to wait. Holy cow! Mr. Murnard yelped as he opened the refrigerator door. He took the pony looking white thing out of the freezer and held it at arm's length. Peter, come down here. What is that? I whispered. Beats me, Chester answered. It looks like a white tomato. Very pretty, I said, as Peter came into the kitchen. Peter, have you been playing with your chemical set in there? No, Dad, why? I thought this might be one of your experiments. Do you know what it is? Z, Dad, it looks like a white tomato. Just when Mrs. Murnau and the tub came in the door. What's all this about? What's all the fuss about? Mrs. Murnau asked. We were just a trying to figure out what it, what this is. And Toby pulled it down so he could get a be better look. Well, he said, it looks like, it, it looks to me like a white tomato. Mr. Murnau took a good, long, good, wrong look. You know, he said to his wife, it really does look like a white tomato. There's, a, there's one way to find out, said Mrs. Murnau, who always was the pra <clears throat> practical one. Let's cut it open and see what's inside. Everybody gathered around the table. I jumped up on a chair, and in all the excitement, no one noticed that I had put my paws on the table, which under normal circumstances was dis discouraged, to say the, at the, to say the least. Chatter wasn't so lucky. Chatter get off the table. Mrs. Murnau said Chatter jumped onto Toby's shoulders. Well, he stayed to view the proceedings. Mrs. Murnau took her sharpest knife and cut cleanly through the thing. It fell into two, two halves. It's a tomato, all right, said Mrs. Murnau. 